Good morning and welcome to Moments with Melinda. I have as my guest, Paul Asbell. Paul, how are you? I am good today. I hope you are too and everybody out there. It's a beautiful sunny day. Well, let me tell my viewers a little bit about you. Paul Asbell is a musician who played the blues in Chicago and since the early 1970s has created a multi-faceted musical career here in Northern Vermont. So it's short for a very long career, but we're gonna ask you lots of questions about your life. Um, Fair enough. So I wanna first say, Tina Turner. Yeah. Yeah, what a, I mean, you know, her, her life is a, a lot of music, but it's also, what a story. I mean. And for, and for women. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, I mean, it's just, so anyway, I just wanted to. Yeah, well, let's. You better, you better be good to her up there, wherever she is. Uh, yeah, better yeah. be good to her. Honor um, her. So, Paul, tell us a little bit about your early years growing up, your childhood, a little bit about your youth. Well, I grew up in Chicago. Um, I grew up in a way that uh, um, most people, it's somewhat different than most people. My folks moved to Chicago from New York in 1946. And my dad um, and mom were kind of a pair. They were hired to, um, to open the chapter of what's called People's Songs in uh, Chicago. There already was a chapter, but they were very active in in, in uh, New York. And People's Songs was basically sort of a left-wing oriented labor movement, civil rights oriented bunch of folks that um, it is the sort of the beginnings of what we often think of as the protest song movement, but this was back in the mid forties. And um, the uh, my dad and his associates were people like Woody Guthrie and Pete Seeger, who was often a guest at our house when we moved to Chicago. And these people were around all the time. And my dad was a musician of sorts. He became really a freelance and book author um, in his somewhat later life. And that's really what he felt he was kind of born to do. But he was a folk singer and a songwriter um, in the beginning. And so I heard music around the house, not from the you know, radio or, or obviously I heard records, but also, you know, he was always rehearsing with people downstairs when I was trying to go to sleep and Pete Seeger would come over the house and he would have his banjo case and he'd have an ax. And I never understood the ax part till much later. Um, it was explained to me that this was part of his stage setup. And, uh, but these were people that I took for granted as kind of growing up knowing about. And, um, so one of the things that, uh, that, I just saw music all the time. We were on the south side of Chicago. I was born at 47th and Drexel. Anybody who knows kind of the geography of Chicago will probably say, really? It was a neighborhood. There was the edge of a neighborhood called Bronzeville. And the, you can probably guess what the bronze term meant. And uh, I looked at my kindergarten picture, you know, maybe when I was about 30 years old, found it in my, my mom, you know, a bunch of stuff in my mom's and like, there's 50 kids in that class, and which one's Paul? Oh, he's the only little white face. Okay, got it. And uh, I, you know, I didn't even remember it quite that way, but it was just, it was growing up as a minority and the majority culture is something that uh, most white people don't have really a sense of. And that was something that uh, was a big part of my upbringing and was kind of, and, and it shapes your life in a lot of ways. Shapes what an extraordinary childhood extraordinary so who would you say provided you with the greatest inspiration to pursue mm. your music career you mean kind of musical inspiration i expect musical inspiration well i think if you asked almost any musician that would evolve over the years uh there were people like doc watson and mississippi john hurt and lightning hopkins who and bob dylan for that matter who when i kind of came of age around you know 12 13 years old those were people that i heard who as i often kind of reference it like they put the hair up on my head you know i i uh they, the hair stood on the back of my head up when i listened to them and i knew okay this is something very special. It's speaking to me. And, you know, quite different than music 
from the radio that spoke to some of my friends and stuff. And there was a small group of people who kind of got that, you know, music often is a niche thing and it's also kind of a bonding thing for people. Um, but, you know, that as I learned to play a little bit more and play better and stuff, uh, that changed. Uh, those people were all basically acoustic guitar players and, and folk oriented uh, performers or blues oriented performers. And uh, at some point, I, you know, electric music at first was just like silliness, you know. And when I saw the Beatles first on Ed Sullivan, like everybody my age, it was like, well, that's, yeah, they, they are kind of cool looking, but I don't know. That's just silly music. And, you know, that changed sort of <laughs> over the years. And it certainly changed when I heard um, electric blues from my hometown of Chicago and all of a sudden realized that electric music was not just silly music. I, I know this is probably very strange sounding to a well, lot of people. I don't I don't think it is. It certainly isn't to me. I mean, think about Dylan when he went electric and what happened. Well, this was long before that. Uh-huh. This oh. was long before that. So oh, yeah. who, who bought you your first guitar? My dad. Well, I used his guitar, of okay, course. Okay, you used your dad's guitar. And then so I that... remember a very, you know, a very big deal would have been right around 1963 three maybe when he actually bought me a, a, a you know it's kind of a surprise present a martin 0018 oh. and uh that's a you know kind of an iconic uh now iconic guitar it was just a quality relatively small guitar that was sort of right for me and um i didn't need to use his stella anymore anybody so, who's a guitarist knows what stella guitars are so. so he was he was a great inspiration for you was your father now you have recorded with some of the greats, and you mentioned a few of them, but let me. Mm -hmm. Water, John Lee Hooker, mm -hmm. Alan Wolf, mm -hmm. Lightning Hopkins, Otis Rush, and others, including Paul Butterfield, while living in Chicago. Tell mm -hmm. us about that time, playing with those greats. Well, these people had all been heroes of mine. And, you know, in my kind of second phase that I alluded to, where all of a sudden I realized that this music that was being made on electric instruments was um was it, it captured my imagination in a huge way but i started loving it before i was able to be legal to get into clubs so and there were clubs that were you know muddy waters and junior wells and howlin wolf played in clubs that were three four blocks from where i lived but i couldn't go there you know and uh I later got false ID like every young musician did in order to be able to get in. And they didn't check really that much. But um, but, you know, when I was 14 years old, that wouldn't have worked. And uh, at a small 14 at that. So at any rate, I, um, you know, first heard them from records, even though I knew that they were around my neighborhood. I'd sometimes even see them sometimes, you know, driving by or parked in front of a club. That, but I couldn't go in. And uh, at some point, I was able to go in, sometimes with uh, slightly older friends. And um, I just got, well, I had already been fired up by the music. At some point, I was actually, I started setting, sitting in with groups. And it wasn't long before I was asked to play rhythm guitar for people that really were heroes of mine. Uh, I mean, they were before that, and they remained that. People like Muddy Waters and... Uh, uh, Howlin' Wolf and Otis Rush. And these people were all around the South Side, right in the neighborhood I grew up in. So um, it, I don't know. It's one thing led to another very quickly back then. Outstanding. I mean, what what a incredible immersion into some of the greatest music of that time. Well, I'm um, grateful for it. And, I mean, growing up, you know, listening to Pete Seeger, Little Boxes, and his 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 effect on the '60s. I'm assuming you were a you were a '60s revolutionary, like me. Uh, well, I, I mean, I didn't throw any Molotov cocktails. Well, of um, course not. Neither did I. I. Did not. But but I'm assuming that you, coming from a liberal family, that using that music and the music of Pete Seeger and and Arlo Guthrie. You know, our music back then was revol was music about change. Well, Arlo Guthrie is close to a contemporary of mine. My dad's friends were Woody Guthrie, his dad. And so um, I would, and there's a lot of what you're saying that's very true. It was change that um, much of which did not happen. Um, and, you know, was 
a pretty big disappointment to many people. Um, the uh, but yes, you're that's right, and that so, was the so, middle year in which I grew up. So, um, well, you know, I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna defend my generation. Our generation is we did help to bring in the civil rights movement, the disability movement, the women's movement. We did fight to shut down a, a, a war. Um, and we changed the way that people looked at the earth and the planet. Earth Day was, you know, bloomed around that time and certainly women's rights. So I think, and I think the music helped with that, mm -hmm. whether it was Joan Baez or Bob Dylan or the, um, or um, whomever it was just, and Woodstock. We were, and I'm not saying that that's not happening now, but it's, a, it's very different. And we'll talk about that. Now, you moved back to Vermont in the early 1970s. And you began your recording career with folks like Big Mama Thornton, Mary McCaslin, Bobby McFerrin, and others. Can you talk about those early years in Vermont? And what, what brought you to Vermont from Chicago? Well, my recording career uh, actually had begun in, in earnest in Chicago, of course. I, when I came to Vermont, which was actually in May of 1971, uh, it's very hard to, if, if I try to explain what was in my, my and my girlfriend's mind at the time, it would be nonsensical, probably because it was. But um, the uh, I had sort of burned out on an extremely intense six night a week playing situation in uh, Chicago, and I saw kind of I, the club I played at. I was playing from ten to four every night, and then on uh, Saturday it was ten to five. So I would be driving home in the daylight, and you know that's when I would catch my sleep would be. At long after the sun came up and basically, you know, well, is this the life I want to live in? The, the kind of halcyon images I had of certain friends who lived um, in a more rural situation, which I'd never really done, uh, that started to really, really appeal. And where did you move to? I where, moved where to North Duxbury, Vermont, which is basically halfway up Campbell's Hump Road on the sort of Duxbury Waterbury side and bought a little tiny plot of land um, in full view of Camel's Hump and built a geodesic dome. If anybody has ever read the whole Earth catalog, you're reading my life, basically. Yeah, the Savonius Rotor, the energy producer that was in Mother Earth News. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Well, that's, that's our generation, my friend. I think a lot of us came up in the early 1970s and bought a cheap, and then we all got FHA loans, which were like 2%, you're less than a half a percent interest. So Paul, you, mm -hmm. you, you became a member of the band Kilimanjaro mm -hmm. and you joined forces with Big Joe Burrell and the Unknown Blues Band. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about Joe and that time in your life during those 20 years. Well, Kilimanjaro was a group of four people at that time. It had actually begun technically as the Paul Asbell Quartet and became, you know, because I selected um, such tremendously, you know, gifted and and uh, skilled and compatible musicians for that group, um, we it just became something much bigger than one guy's group. So we definitely kind of reflected the the sort of democracy of the spirit of the thing by calling it Kilimanjaro. Um, and uh, we played in Burlington uh, and, and kind of regionally, we did a lot of touring later. Um, we were playing music that was vocalist music. It was based on uh, songwriting that really was not very pop. It was a little bit pop, but it had so many jazz influences to it that it's kind of amazing that we were able to do things like play three and sometimes even four night weekends at uh, Hunts, for example, which was the sort of higher ground of Burlington at that time. And um the and I'm sure there's some people around who are old enough to remember all those times. And at any rate, this was all happening um, prior to, not prior to me knowing Big Joe, but prior to us having anything to do with Big Joe sort of on stage. At one point, we started playing with a very good friend uh, of mine named Martin Grosswent. And Martin basically was doing a blues night on Wednesday that we were the band for, the Kilimanjaro guys. And as we actually called the band at that time, the Unknown Blues Band, because it was a joke, because really everybody knew that it was Kilimanjaro behind Martin. And that went for a while. And that was a Wednesday often, not always, but often before our Thursday, Friday, Saturday of Kilimanjaro. 
And what I'm getting at is that at some point it became clear that um, there were other people that, you know, would love to fit into this group. And I knew this guy named Big Joe Burrell, who was playing occasionally in town. And I knew that this guy would be a perfect fit for this band that we were calling the Unknown Blues Band. And so I kind of said, you know, hey, let's invite Joe down. I just I guarantee you sparks will fly. We don't need to rehearse to do this. And uh, when the night that that happened, um, the point was proved that Joe was such an incredible natural fit. What we said at the time was there was a slot in the band that we didn't even know was waiting for Joe. And as soon as Joe came on the scene, bingo, you know, there it is. We've been missing him all along. He's the perfect person to basically front this band. And um so at any rate, that was really kind of the beginnings of the Unknown Blues Band. And we were or originally playing a Wednesday prior to three nights of this sort of jazz pop funk band called Kilimanjaro. And at some point it became so popular, the Unknown Blues Band thing, that it became kind of clear, you know, if we keep doing this, guys, this is going to kind of out popular the Kilimanjaro thing. So are we, do we really want to do this? And we kind of took a vote, you know, we were democratic and uh, yeah, sure. We don't know how long Joe will be in the picture and whatever. And so let's just give it all we have. And, you know, so we wound up sort of flip-flopping at some point and we would then, then do Kilimanjaro would be the um, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday, Saturday would have been the Unknown Blues Band. And then it became Kilimanjaro just on the Wednesday and, you know, that sort of thing. So it was clear that we were giving our efforts to Unknown Blues Band just because of the popularity and we're still playing together. And, and sometimes we even played some of the same songs. But anyway, that became our us and Big Joe's kind of entrance onto the scene at that point. On the stage. Onto the stage, and of course, big big Joe Burrell's um, beautiful bronze statue is outside of Halverson's, and yeah. boy, that you you guys, we all rock to your music with Kilimanjaro, and also with Big Joe Burrell, and mm. so let's move a little bit into your your teaching. You are an educator. You have taught guitar for over fifty years. You taught at the university level um, at Dartmouth and St. Michael's, and now you're at Middlebury college and the university of Vermont. Talk mm -hmm. about, um, that part of your life and, and, and helping other people to, to learn, uh, to play, to play music. Well, I, I I'll try to, um, I, I started teaching, um, yeah, I started to, as I'm thinking about it now, I started teaching like in the late sixties while I was still in Chicago. And at some point I kind of realized that, um, I had learned at that point in almost entirely on my own. I've had two lessons in my life and I never went to music school, um, you know, to learn the music that I do. And uh, so it was kind of a challenge to think of, all right, well, if you're self-taught, then how do you teach somebody else? And somehow I think I kind of figured out some of the aspects of it sort of early on because there was so many things that I had to figure out for myself. I kind of, when I did figure those things out, I tended to remember how I got them. And so I tried to simulate in some ways, uh, how could I, how could I rearrange the order in which I did things so that if I had it to do all the over again, here's what I do first. And here's what I would do next. And here's what I do next. And I wouldn't do that until I had already done this, that kind of thing. That wasn't how I learned. I learned in a very haphazard, passion driven way. But then I tried to kind of make sense of what, you know, rearrange the things. So this is what I would show to somebody else. And that just went for years and years and years of kind of teaching in, in private situations, one on one. Uh, to teaching a lot of lessons where everybody who had come would be very, very different in their aspirations and their skill level and stuff like that. And you can't have a one size fits all approach to all of that. I kind of got good at like no one size fits all so, uh, teaching. Do you, by, do you play by ear? Well, it's that that's a complicated. Because you had to teach yourself to read music, right? Yeah, that's true. And that's and to do that on your own is. You, you, that would make you a great teacher because you would know how then to teach uh, someone who doesn't doesn't play music. So talk to us a little bit about your three solo acoustic CDs. Um, okay. They've received rave reviews 
for how you intermix blues and jazz with old time country based themes and original pieces from the American roots tradition. Now this all comes from your website. So yeah. I want to direct my viewers to go to the Paul Asbell, P-A-U-L, asbell.com website where you can read all about Paul and order his CDs and and, and learn about his music and his life. Well, but tell you. us about those three CDs. Um, uh, and 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 because they're there you created them recently talked about that well I, the first one i think was in 2002 but I, I had been making music for an awful long time um before that and it's funny because i a guy i know a friend of mine named rick davis who was a guitar builder and at that time was also sort of the the head fred so to speak of the of a luthier's guild um called asia and um, he encouraged me to uh, to perform solo. He said, you know, you're good enough to do it. You're better than some people who do it all the time. Why don't you? You know, you owe it to people. Who, you know, a whole bunch of stuff that I just thought, oh, Rick, come, I'm, no, you, you completely misunderstand what it is that I do. And this is all me in my head. I don't even think I ever said it. But I thought to myself, what a terrible idea. I'm destined and put on this earth to play with other people. It was seemed clear to me, you know. And at some point, well, you know, it's so much harder, especially with guitar, to kind of perform on your own and to make an entire accompaniment or maybe even an entire instrumental performance on one instrument, the guitar. But I let me just give it a shot. And I started um, as a result, kind of going back to the music that I had actually started doing long before I ever picked up an electric guitar, namely the music of people like Mississippi John Hurt and Lightning Hopkins and and uh, Doc Watson and a whole bunch of acoustic styles that um, grabbed my attention first on guitar. And at any rate, I realized, you know, maybe Rick was right. And uh, I started doing, you know, very nervously doing some solo performances um, and I discovered after getting over enough nerves so that I could find in addition to the nerves, like there's something really great about a room full of people who are just totally silent, allowing you to fill entirely the space with who you are. And I, I kind of never experienced that really before. And I was once, a, you know, one, as I said, once the nervousness kind of gave way to the sort of exhilaration of this is kind of cool. And uh, I, I if I say I never look back, that that isn't quite true. because well, there are times Well, as well, you should never look back, but your your <laughs> your life is extraordinary. I still do it. So keep I'm doing it tomorrow that. night, in fact. Well, I mean, so. For my viewers, I'm assuming that people can live stream your your music if they don't want a CD. I'm I'm assuming. I don't. Uh, there's not a lot of live stream. I ha I didn't jump onto the live streaming. So the way so the way to listen to your music would be on YouTube or go to your website and you do, and at Paul Asbell A S B E L L dot com, and mm -hmm. they can see your CDs. Now let's move on to your accolades. You, you have received so many accolades and so many awards over the years. Um, talk to us a little bit about your duo partners, um, about those recordings where you hooked up with people and played um, with folks. Well, it's, I mean, all along, you know, my entire music world was in bands and of different sizes. Um, I started, yeah, after I started doing the, uh, the, the uh, solo thing, you know, that kind of led to playing kind of duos with people like Brooks Williams, who is a, you know, very kind of a roots music guy, much like myself, but also more of a songwriter. And uh, I also started playing, I had already been playing jazz quite a bit. And in jazz, very often for a guitarist, a really good duo is playing with a bass player, an upright bass player. I do that a lot. Um in a perfect world, if you know, if a jazz artist was asked, like, when you play duo, would you, in you know, is duo better than trio or quartet or whatever? I think most jazz people would say, ah, frankly, I like playing with a slightly larger group. I think most people would say that, although sometimes, like as last night, a duo is really fun to do. Um, what but, happened last night? Tell us about. I, last well, night. I just I played with my longtime bassist buddy, uh, Clyde Stats, at um, Flat, American Flatbread, 
And so there's a lot, which is a great place and we love it. And, uh, but there's a lot of times when, um, you know, the idea of doing a duo is really just because there's not really enough money to pay for two other guys or whatever. And that's a sort of, it's, I won't say it's a dirty little secret, but it's just a reality that basically you're playing duo because it's hard to afford to play. But, but also if it's a smaller place, the more people, the louder, once you add, add drums into the mix, it can get funkier and more, you know, kind of infectious, but, <laughs> but also it's hard not to play louder. So there are places where duo is exactly the right vibe. And so I'm, I'm going to have you play something um, because I'm just getting so eager to hear you. But oh. can you tell folks, I'm going to tell folks that look, um, mm -hmm. well, you just released Burmese Panther, it's original jazz compositions, and you have a lot of concert dates scheduled. And so I want my viewers to go again to your website. Paul Asbell, A S B E L L dot com backslash gigs backslash and there and your all your gigs are listed there and people can come out and hear you live. But would you like to play a little something? I would be happy to. Day, Paul? I would be so honored. Well, that's that. really sweet of you to say. Um, uh, yeah, I would be delighted to. This song is actually <laughs> it's half of the title track of um, my third acoustic solo CD, which was called Here Goes from adamant to a chafalaya. And oh my God, nobody can pronounce that, including myself. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it when I titled it, but there were two songs on it. One of them is called a chafalaya, hard thing to pronounce, but that's a, uh, a swamp in Louisiana that basically has a kind of gave, you know, contributed its vibe to a very bluesy kind of song that I'm not going to play. And the other tune on the CD was bound for adamant and which I am going to play. And those two songs kind of represent the sort of spectrum of the music that I love. And uh, so here at any rate is you're bound for adamant. <laughs> I'm sorry, let me start this again. There we go. That was so beautiful. Thank you, Paul. I want to share with my viewers, we're coming to the end of the show, but I want to share with my viewers, thank you for that. That was oh, lovely. Um, you hooked up again with Chaz Eller. Now, Chaz, yeah. we all know Chaz, great guy. He was the Kilimanjaro keyboardist, and you just began a two-year recording project with him. So I wanted to mention that. That's in the works for you, right? Well, just very clear, Chuck has been, I call him Chuck because... <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. Well, Chuck, everybody Chuck calls, Elfrey. yeah, Chuck Charles Chaz. Chuck is- <laughs> and yeah. I know Chuck for such a long time, I can't get it out of my head. I'll call him Chuck, call right? Chuck. But at um, any rate, uh, he has been the, re- the recording engineer for every one of the recordings that uh, I have including that most recent jazz one, Burmese Panther, but also the three before. Um, he, We have collaborated on so many things that such a, a lot of kind of mutual, you know, shorthand for music stuff. There's a lot of things where we don't have to explain stuff to one another. You know, he'll say, it's a little bit, and I already know where he's going to, I know what the little, I know what the rest of the sentence is going to be. And we, I think it's kind of back, in fourth mutual. So we complete one another's senses, sentences in a lot of ways musically. And uh, so at any rate, he has been a terrific kind of ally in my recording recordings and yeah, long time. You've made, you've made many, 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 many friends here in Vermont and you're so beloved. I just wanna ask you one more question before we end. Um, what are some words of wisdom that you would like to leave with us as it relates to the state of humanity in our world? Oh man. Paul Asbel, what's, what's a little bit of, of your wisdom, your aged wisdom that you'd like to share with my viewers? Oh, man. Well, uh, I don't want to get too long-winded about it. I also don't know that wisdom is exactly what I have to impart, but I want to say one little message that my life has been about, which I think I alluded to earlier. I grew up as a distinct minority in the neighborhood that I grew up in, and I think that that's a pretty good way to learn to live. It's I definitely has some rough spots and there's a couple of scars in there um, as a result of that and a certain amount of, uh, you know, intimidation that, you know, you see towards your fellow man at times. But the idea of not assuming that somehow you're in the minority on things, I mean, if you're in the majority on things, but realizing that you are just one voice, there's an awful lot of other voices and uh, you can't assume that everybody's like you. Um, that really, I think, is a lesson you learn when you grow up as a minority. And I, if there was something that I guess I would pass on, I'd think, yeah, don't be so sure of yourself and your ideas that you're somehow think that all the world agrees with you. And um, Well said, my friend. And I'll tell you, yours is a voice that we have all uh, come to love and appreciate over the years in your humanity and humility are a great comfort. So thank you, Paul Asbel, for your time and your moment with Melinda. I've just loved every second of it. And um, I hope I can get you back on my show again. And to my viewers, I want to thank you for joining me and Paul today. And I will see you again soon. Have a beautiful day. Bye-bye.